you know, the typical prototype that I talk about in my 2011 book is of a trader buying 700 or 800 phones, putting it in 32 kilograms of luggage, carrying it back. But that's not what people do in Guangzhou. Why? Well, one big reason why is that, as many people have described to me, chucking matches is like a pond. Guangzhou is the ocean. People buy a lot more goods in Guangzhou. And often they would buy, for example, a whole container's worth of tiles or furniture, or 500 kilograms worth of clothing, or 300 kilos worth of TVs. For that kind of trade, you need a cargo agent. Cargo agents are the people who really know what's going on and can make sure your shipment adequately gets through. But these logistics agents are interesting because they're not simply like DHL, you know, you go to them, give them your shipment, and, and walk away. These guys are often the ambassadors between China and Africa here. Uh, they don't just ship cargo. You know, these, these cargo, uh, these logistics agents do things like often find accommodations for the traders. Many traders stay in these cargo agents' houses. They also open up bank accounts for them in China. They accompany them to get visas. They source their goods and find where they can buy these goods. They do everything for these guys. And so I think it's accurate to say that cargo agents really are the ambassadors between China and uh, Africa and the Middle East. That's what these guys do. Traders come and go. Traders often have 30 days of visa, but the cargo agents stay. Some of them legally. Some of them have long-term visas to be in China. Many more illegally. They're visa overstayers, but they can still do this job. That is what they do here. I've interviewed 14 cargo agents in all in Guangzhou, as well as a bunch of traders, at all different scales and levels. At the lowest level, they're guys who are you know, taping up a box themselves and taking it by hand to the truck waiting outside. At the highest level, you know, there are some of these guys who have CCTV cameras looking at six different warehouses where goods are being loaded. Uh, they're in their office in a rather upscale neighborhood. And there's a lot of guys in the middle who are between these two extremes. But I've interviewed a whole range of these different people, and I quote only a few at length here, but many more I've interviewed, and, and their views are in here as well. Okay. Um, I should also note, by the way, that I will have a number of quotations from the people I've interviewed here. Every interview I do, I take. And so these are verbatim quotations of what they're saying. I don't identify these people, except by country, and even then, sometimes I lie, because often it's fairly delicate stuff that these people shouldn't be caught saying. But these quotations are verbatim from take. Let me begin, though, with a, a somewhat theoretical notion, that of low-end globalization. When most people think of globalization, they think of high-end globalization, which involves large corporations with their hundreds of millions of dollars in advertising budgets, uh, millions, you know, uh, skyscrapers full of employees in suits and ties, dozens of lawyers working for them. This is the globalization that most people here think of, the globalization of Apple, McDonald's, Samsung, all those big companies. But there also is low-end globalization. This I define as the transnational flow of people and goods involving relatively small amounts of capital and informal, sometimes semi-legal or illegal transactions, often associated with the developing world, but present everywhere. You can find this in New York and Paris, just as much as in uh, uh, you know, Lagos and, and Nairobi. Now, low-end globalization is globalization as experienced by most of the world's people. If you talk about globalization in Africa, in much of Latin America, in South Asia, it is low end. I mean, one obvious factor in this is you can't get goods into Kenya, into Nigeria, into most sub-Saharan African countries without bribing customs agents, without dealing in the underground economy. That means it's low end globalization. It's below the radar of the law. That's par for the course in these countries. Anybody who didn't bribe, bribe uh, customs agents would be completely insane. You'd go into business almost instantly. So this is the nature of this globalization. And logistics agents are engaged in low-end globalization. Um, some of you may want to ask later in questions about how exactly these customs agents are, I'm uh, sorry, these logistics agents are part of low-end globalization. One factor is that mostly they're ethnic. 
In other words, if I'm dealing with a Somali, he's dealing with other Somalis. If I'm dealing with a Ghanaian, he's dealing with other Ghanaians. And often people in this particular ethnic group. Um, it's often done on the basis of face recognition. A number of the uh, customs, uh, sorry, the logistics agents I know won't deal with a stranger who comes in their door. They've got to know the person. And if they don't know the person, they'll get on the phone. Hey, do you know this guy? He says he knows you. It's on the basis of recommendations. It's not like DHL where you go in and place your order. This is done on the basis of close human relations. Okay. Now, another factor to deal with here is China's role in low end globalization. China's role is that, as I'll talk about shortly, it makes knockoff goods. It makes goods that people in the developing world want to buy. And as I'll say over and over again today, this may be China's major role in early 21st century globalization. China has become the world's manufacturing powerhouse thanks to such factors as an abundant and cheap labor force, control and work discipline, economic reforms, and also integration into the WTO in 2004. But, one key factor to remember is a major feature of most Chinese manufacturing is that its goods are of low price. China brand names are largely unknown in the developed world. You know, what do people here know? You know Huawei probably, you know Lenovo, not too many other brands. But in the developing world, China is a major source of goods. You can't go to Africa without seeing all those red, white, and blue bags that are ubiquitous. Their goods coming from China. China's role in low end globalization is aided by the fact that the rule of law remains quite flexible, particularly in terms of copy and knockoff goods. You can make these goods and ship them out without too much worry about the law. Now, another matter to be uh, thought about here at length is types of goods. And we talk about copies, but that's a very imprecise designation. Instead, I want to talk about copies, near copies, and knockoffs. And it gets a little bit confusing because sometimes people talk about copies encompassing all of these, and that's fair enough, but there is an important difference here. Copies are products designed to be exact replicas of Korean, Japanese, European, or American goods. You know, down to the last letter of the brand name. Now, are copies exactly like the original? No, they're generally of shoddier quality. Also, there are other factors. For example, uh, I wrote in my 2011 book that you buy a copy Nokia in Chile Mansions and it's likely to weigh 40% less than the original. Why? Because the Chinese made them with lighter materials. That was the easiest way to tell the copy from the original. But basically, the copy, these copies are designed to look as close as possible like the original. And often for a copy phone or other good, you know, you have to go so far as to dial the number that's given in the instruction manual to see whether it's real or copy. There also are near copies, and these are copies with a minor variation in name. Something like Apply instead of Apple, or Nokla instead of Nokia, or Seco instead of Seiko, and so on. These are done, frankly, for legal protection. <laughs> uh, I don't know how much protection you get, but apparently you do get significant protection. I note that in the list of allowed goods, I see SECO watches. SECO, S-E-K-O, are allowed to be sent because they assume no one's ever going to make a mistake between SECO and SECO. Now, um, I should mention here that these goods are, well, I'll say that later. Okay. Then there are knockoffs, and knockoffs are copies in design, but with their own Chinese brand names or no brand names. Knockoffs are, in fact, copies because the design has been copied, but you don't know it from the brand name. And an overwhelming number of goods in, in China are knockoffs. There are many more knockoffs than, than there are copies and near copies. Okay, now, the first of these are illegal, and customs might confiscate them. Uh, copies are illegal to send out, but having said that, I spoke to a shipping agent at the Canton Trade Fair, and I pretended like I was an American who wanted to get copy medicines made, which is the lowest form of copy in which you can kill people. Okay, but anyway, I was pretending to be this. And I said, look, I want to get these copies made here, and I want to send them to the U.S. Can you get them through China Customs for me? And the shipping agent said, no problem. I guarantee you I can get them through. It's just that I can't guarantee you can get them into the U.S. You've got to face customs there on your own, but we can get them out of China. 
So, she obviously had connections to make this possible. Chinese customs won't ever admit this, and they are doing what they can to stop copies, they say. But this is what this uh, shipping agent sent him. Now, African traders and logistics agents say to me that only 1 to 2 percent of the copy goods they send through are confiscated. So that 98, 99 percent get through. Um, obviously, it's a drag if your goods get confiscated, but that's a pretty minor business expense. You know, presumably, if you send 100 containers of copies, one or two will be confiscated only. And so your profits aren't eaten into a whole lot. The second of these categories, the near copies, are often legal. I talked to a lawyer at the Canton Trade Fair, and he said something interesting. He said, Chinese law is such that if the consumer might justifiably mistake the copy for the original, then it's illegal. So presumably, the Chinese consumer will know the difference between seco and seco, between apply and apple. And these goods are deemed more or less legal for this reason. The third of these goods, as I said earlier, uh, includes many, if not possibly most, of the goods manufactured in China today. And knockoffs are no problem getting through customs. This can be done. Let me get some quotations from people I've talked to. A Nigerian trader and logistics agents. The whole idea of copies as contraband is strange because everything in China is a copy. <laughs> if you make an iPhone but put your own label on it, that's not categorized as contraband because it's not labeled as an iPhone. Contraband is illegal, and he's right that you can make these knockoffs, and those are considered to be legal within China, although not necessarily elsewhere. A Kenyan logistics agent. Even if it's a complete copy, we can ship it at a risk. What if one letter is changed, for example? Samsung instead of Samsung. Well, in Kenya it may be okay, but not in the way. In Dubai it might still be considered a copy. If it's a knockoff, an iPhone made by a Chinese company without the iPhone label, that's no problem at all. I have seen people who ask for special copy phones made for them in Shenzhen, and they'll use as a brand a popular girl's name. That's no problem. They sell like hotcakes because everybody with that name wants the phone. <laughs> Smart brand, I guess. Um, it's interesting what he says, though, because he indicates that there's no universal law on this, and what might be considered a copy in one domain might not be considered a copy in another. You know, these China-made knockoffs, getting them into the U.S. would be rather difficult, I suspect, but getting it into most developing world countries, probably not. Now, customs will attempt to catch copies, but often not near copies, at least not in China. They're not going to worry about that. And not knockoffs. Knockoffs are not chased by customs in China, but rather by lawsuits. Now, I don't want to criticize the Chinese government here, because I know several Americans who have sued Chinese companies for knockoffs and won in China. I know one guy who uh, is the chief executive of a company called Nokera, making solar lamps, no kerosene solar lamps. He's had eight lawsuits in China against people making knockoffs of his goods. He's won all eight of them. Just last week, he won 23,000 US dollars. Now, as he tells me, that might not mean much, because unless the company is forced to destroy its dyes, its manufacturing capabilities, they'll just make them over again. But nonetheless, you know, China is uh, supportive. Also, the Apple detective in Hong Kong, uh, who I spoke with at length, said that China is pretty cooperative in terms of helping Apple fight these knockoff companies. But again, this isn't done in customs. This is done in the court of law. It's a different matter. That's where these work. Now, logistics agents are the ones charged with getting all these goods between China and Africa. And in interviewing them, I asked them, what are your worries in transporting goods? One thing they said is, um, you don't need to worry about corruption. Chinese customs is not corrupt. Now, corruption is widespread elsewhere in China. Just a few days ago, I was speaking with several Nigerians about the best way to bribe a policeman. We have a long argument about the techniques for this. But in terms of customs, no. As a Ghanaian logistics agent said, there's no problem in Chinese customs as long as you declare and you properly deal with goods which require customs documents before you send them. As long as you follow the rules and prepare the customs documents, there's no fraud or extortion. 
All you need to do is follow the law. Officials won't say pay me extra, not in China. Now, I talked earlier about the uh, shipping agent who said, yeah, you can get your copies, your copies through customs. That does seem to exist, but not in terms of the agent saying, the customs agent saying, hey, pay me extra or I won't let your goods through. We don't see that happen. Instead, other forms of contraband, getting them through customs, truly are a nightmare, as a Kenyan logistics agent told me. A Kenyan woman delivered cargo to our sea cargo office. The Chinese warehouse man didn't check anything as he should have. He just took CDM. All six boxes were pornographic cassettes, forbidden by the Chinese government. It was a nightmare for us. The shipment was divided into two containers, and the Chinese government withheld both containers. They arrested the Chinese man who loaded them, and they arrested the African man in our office. It took the company 14 days to locate him in jail. The other customers using these two containers had their shipments delayed by three months as a consequence. It was terrible. And this man tells us something interesting. These shipping agents don't like to send illegal goods because very often in a container, you'll have 10 or 20 different customers putting goods in there. And if there's one bit of contraband in the container, the entire thing gets delayed by three months in this case. And your company will have a very bad reputation because of this. Because of this. So there is a good reason for the shipping agents to follow the law to a considerable degree. Another agent told another story. He said, a customer calls from Tanzania. I want to come and do business in China. Please tell me. Uh, please send me an invitation. What can you do? All I can do to cut the risk is ask them to send me a scan of their passport. Then putting the passport number, I use a Chinese company to send them an invitation. The agent in Tanzania may use the same invitation for others. They make copies. So the name of our company will keep occurring. Use by people you don't know. So you see the problem here. This stuff uh, just becomes viral, your own company's name. And then the customer you've invited, you've never met her before, request that you pick her up. I'm coming by night. I've never been to China. Please meet me at the airport. You just trusted God. You don't even know if she's carrying drugs in her stomach. But if you don't do that, somebody else will and take the business. We're always walking a tightrope. It's a very dangerous business to be in. There's a great risk of finding myself in an unintended crime. My interest is in the cargo. I can be a pawn in the game. If I pick a woman like pick up a woman like this at the airport who has drugs, they will ask, who was waiting for this woman who was arrested? Who sent her the invitation? The first person the Chinese authorities will pick up is me, no one else. Yeah, it is indeed a dangerous business. Now, other contraband is not so dramatic. In Guangzhou, one warehouse handling goods to be shipped by container to West African countries has fading signs indicating that non-contraband goods cost $130 per cubic meter, U.S., but contraband goods cost U.S. $140 per cubic meter. Um, this is indicative of the fact that up until 2011, importing any clothing into Nigeria was illegal. I'm sorry I wanted this sign to show you. I tried to copy it this afternoon and paste it, but it didn't come out. Anyway, that's what the sign says. And, you know, $10 is not much. But that, apparently, is the cost of bribing officials in Nigeria. Not very much. It's a regular thing. The Nigerian government wants to protect its textile industry. There is no textile industry. So tens of thousands of people have to bring in containers full of clothing. And it's a regular matter. Pay off customs this much, it's decided. You know, it's all taken care of. Now, another factor that everyone is worried about is loss and pilferage. A Nigerian logistics agent said, if the airline loses my package, they will only compensate 20%. This falls back to the logistics company. I pay half of the value to my customers. That's a big loss for us. I've had customers punch me because of the loss they're angry about. I have to defend myself. Again, a dangerous business. He has to learn martial arts because of angry customers. He continued, sometimes the airline workers steal the goods when the guards are not watching. This often happens in small and popular cities like Addis Ababa. A hungry man is an angry man and will do whatever he can to sustain his living. Now, that may be partially true. In the developed world, you're a little more likely to use your goods, but pilferage could take place anywhere. It takes place in China. One cargo agent told me an interesting story. He had packed 100 mobile phones and had the cargo declaration the night before. Then, by chance, he came to his office early 
the next morning at 6.30 in the morning. And he found his Chinese employee already there. Why? Well, he looked in the box and found, sure enough, five mobile phones were gone. What happened, of course, is this Chinese employee figured that this is the best time to steal the phones because all that remains is to seal the box and then send it. No one's going to check in the box after the declaration's already been made. And so you can blame Dubai. You can blame some other place. And so the Chinese employee figured he could get away with, with this. Well, he wasn't. He was fired. But that's what happened. I also have heard of pilferage taking place in the Hong Kong airport. Now, I know, but that's what several uh, uh, cargo agents have told me, and in Dubai, particularly. Um, pilferage, stealing these goods, is getting better. One technique that they've begun to use this year only is, when you steal mobile phones from a box, don't just take them. Instead, have a mold that weighs the same amount as the mobile phone, and keep the box in there. Just take the phone, put in the mold, it's going to weigh the exact same thing. So no one will know anything has been stolen until the box arrives at its destination. Then you open up the box for your mobile phone and you just see a stone mold. Pretty clever. Okay. Now I want to talk about sending copies through customs. Copies have been ubiquitous in China. Lin estimates that copy phones constituted some 30% of the Chinese cell phone market in 2008. It's a little bit lower now, I think, because smartphones are harder to copy. But still, copies are everywhere. Um, there are, in Guangzhou, malls devoted almost entirely to copies. Watch City, for example, near the Guangzhou railway station in Computer City. I've been to Watch City uh, three hours after a police raid, and I said I want to buy 500 copies of this specialized watch. They wouldn't tell me right there, but they took me upstairs to the special room. Sure enough, they showed me all their copies, and we were bargaining about price. They're not too worried about police and getting caught. Although, occasionally there are clampdowns, and people need to worry about that to a degree. Copies have become somewhat less prevalent. Just to give you an example of this, when I did my research in Chunky Mansions in 2006 and 2007, my guess would be that 50% of the phones being dealt were copies. Today, I would say it's well under 20%. There aren't very many copies sold. And the biggest reason for this does not have anything to do with greater law enforcement. The biggest reason is rather simple. It has to do with improvements in technology. In 2006, 2007, 2008, you had a, a Taiwanese company called MediaTek that made motherboards. So that that the best Nokia phones at the time, you could make copies using that motherboard that were awfully good. You could make copies at 40% of the price that would be 80% as good as the original phone. With smartphones, you can't do that. Copies aren't very good, and a good copy will be 80% the price of the original. So copies aren't worth it so much anymore. There's far fewer copies. Instead, in Chunky Mentions, you see you know, a lot more people selling real iPhones at a discount. All of the mobile phone sellers are uh, really upset by this, and many are going out of business. But this is not because of greater law enforcement, as I said, but again, because of a shift in technology. Another broader trend is that China-made knockoffs as a whole are getting better. It used to be that the reputation of China-made goods was terrible. China-made goods are garbage, you know, as a, as a trader told me once. In Africa, the garbage is full of things made in China. Everywhere you look. Every garbage shop you see, China-made goods. But this is slowly beginning to change. And when you have better Chinese products, people are less embarrassed by having these Chinese products. You know, people will see you have a Chinese TV, for example, and they won't think it's junk anymore. So the market for copies has gone down because of this. Now, one recent technique that makes a lot of sense, if you're going to sell copies, don't have the label emblazoned right on the TV or the mobile phone or the computer. Instead, it's very simple. Get stickers. And that's what they're doing more and more. If you're making, for example, copy Dell computers, don't put the, the Dell logo on the computer. Put a real logo. Then get 10,000 stickers made. And once you arrive back in Nigeria, put the stickers on yourself. That's common sense. But that certainly saves you a great deal of frustration from law enforcement. Now, can stickers get caught? Yeah. 
But what you do is send the computers as knockoffs via one shipment and then simply a manila folder with 10,000 stickers in another shipment or made by air freight, you're in all likelihood going to get away with this. And then simply have your worker back in Kenya or Nigeria put your sticker on. That's amazing common sense, but that's what's happening. Okay. Um, despite all I've said, massive numbers of copies as well as near copies, and of course knockoffs, continue to be sent. The question of copies is never, ever one of morality. I've never had any of the people I know uh, that are buying copy electronics or copy clothing express any moral qualms whatsoever. What they say as a rule is, my job is to bring customers what they want. If they want copies, I bring them copies. But it's interesting. As a rule, these traders themselves do not use copies. I love talking to traders in Xiaobei or in Sanyo Li uh, and ask them about their iPad. I say, do you have a copy iPad? Oh, no, I would never have a copy iPad. I sell it to them, but I have a real iPad. That's what you always are going to hear. Now, in copies of clothing, the issue of quality is a little bit less obvious. Uh, for example, one, one of my favorite stories in Xiaobei Xiao is when I went into a store selling copy NBA uh, gear. And it was very funny because the NBA gear looked very good. You remember this, Vanessa. But when you looked at uh, the actual figure on the NBA logo, it was a woman instead of a man. <laughs> the lips were a little bit too broad. And clearly, whoever was making the copies didn't quite get the anatomical details right, which was interesting. But having said that, I assume that the fabric and the longevity of this piece of clothing would be just as good as the original. In electronics, on the other hand, the copy is obviously going to be of lesser quality than the original. Now, it depends whether it's an A-grade copy, a B-grade copy, or a C-grade copy, but you know, the electronics, you can generally tell the difference. Customs in most developing world countries are not too interested in catching copies. Why? Well, because what Customs is worried about is putting tax money in their coffers. And if you confiscate coffee, copies, it doesn't help you much. In fact, copies might help if you can get the guy bringing copies in to pay for them as if they were original goods. So that, I mean, if I was in an African country and somebody was bringing in a thousand iPads, copies, I'd say, these are real iPads, aren't they? Yes. Okay, you've got to pay this amount of high duty because they're real. Well, yeah, take the money. Don't worry if they're copies. Instead, overwhelmingly, these uh, customs in developing world countries are worried about undeclared goods. Because undeclared goods, once you bring them to light, are where you get your tax money as well as your products. That's what they're concerned about. Now, one other point to make here. Um, when copy goods are carried in luggage across the China-Hong Kong border, um, how is it done? Well, the key is very simple. It's to look very nonchalant. And I know a number of Indians and Pakistanis and Chinese veterans who regularly bring copies in. But they're not too worried. Why? Because typically they're carrying some copies in with a lot of other goods, and even if they do get caught, you know, they might get caught with a box of copies among lots of other goods, and the worst penalty su they'll suffer will probably be confiscation of the goods alone. That's all. They're not going to go to jail for this. Um, you know, it, it's often said that customs can tell criminals by looking at their body language. I don't know about you, but I've occasionally looked at that program and banged up abroad, where you see these stupid foreigners picked up for smuggling drugs, and they're nervous as hell in customs. Of course they're nervous. If they get caught, they're going to jail for the rest of their lives, or going to be shot, or something like that. But carrying contraband goods, carrying copy goods, the penalties aren't very big, and so you can afford to relax. You can afford not to worry a whole lot. So these guys do look fairly nonchalant, and they're hard to be catched by customs for that reason. Now, one important point. For sending copies, containers are universally viewed as safer than air freight. And that's rather clear. Containers are a lot bigger, and it takes a lot more work to get inside them. You saw that picture of the container. You know, you really got to work. Air freight, if it's a box, even if it's 200 kilos, you can get in. You can't get into a container very easily. Now, yes, you scan it. Scanning can only see so much. And so the typical reaction of the customs official will be, open up the container, look a little bit at it. Okay, it's okay. Shut it. Next. So that's where you can bring this stuff through. Now, how do you send copies? 
As one logistics agent said, if I have to hide copy iPads in the container, I place them in a refrigerator deep inside the container. Then I put a wooden frame on the refrigerator for protection. You know, customs is not going to go through and smash open this wooden frame. It's too much trouble. The guy is gambling. Another logistics agent, and I'm not identifying countries here for obvious reasons. When I'm loading, I start with the clothes because they attract much more taxes. Because we have local garments in my home country, there's protectionism in place. Construction materials don't attract much tax, and also computer parts. Put them on top. To beat customs, we will put in the container the things that attract minimal or no customs duties last. So that if anyone has to open the container, that's the first thing they'll see. So, put the stuff you want to hide first in the container, because you've got to go a long way to get in there and see it. You know, this is obvious, but I think this works more often than not. Remember, there's only one way to get into a container. It's not as if you have a front entrance or back entrance. And this tells pretty clearly how you send stuff if you want to hide anything. Okay. A Nigerian logistics agent maintained to me that in those very rare cases when copy goods are intercepted, as a rule, someone has tipped off customers. There are no coincidences. He must use his contacts. Uh, and, and somebody has screwed him over if he's caught. It's never simply because customs agents were diligent. But he also said something interesting. He said, all I can really do is pray to God and leave it in God's hands and hope these goods go through. Yes, preparation is important, but God is more important in getting goods through. <laughs> Other agents have told me the same thing. They don't talk about God, but they talk about Allah. But Allah or God is what is key. And this is really interesting because you're sending illegal goods through, but God is going to protect you. <laughs> Which makes sense, actually. Um, because this guy himself is practically powerless in guaranteeing the global passage of his goods, prayer is the only option. And prayer works. God or Allah is looking over these guys because they are caught very rarely. Almost always they get away with it. So you might consider becoming either Christian or Muslim if you're sending goods, because it works. <laughs> now, the next thing I want to talk about here is corruption, because that's a key factor. The logistic agents I spoke with often dislike China because of cheating by suppliers in the middle. And almost every African merchant and Middle Eastern merchant in Guangzhou has a story about being cheated by Chinese merchants. Also, these are difficult. Uh, just last month, three Nigerian heroin dealers were killed because they jumped out of a six-story window when the police were raiding uh, their, their drug den. And as a result, after that, the police have been, un the customs officials have been, un and immigration officials have been unwilling to extend any visas. Nigerians are infuriated by that. They're being forced out of Guangzhou, basically. But, as I said earlier, there is really no corruption in customs, and it's hard to find anybody criticizing Chinese customs. But corruption is a fact of life in most sub-Saharan African countries. It's everywhere. These entrepreneurs generally voice little outrage over the situation in terms of their own business, as long as the corruption is regular and calculated. You know, they don't care about corruption as long as it's the kind of thing you can understand. The real nightmare is if one shipment you pay 0%, the next shipment you pay 200%, because you can't calculate that. But if it's a constant rate of payment, you can calculate that in your shipment, calculate that in your fees, and get by it. As uh, one Kenyan cargo agent told me, the standard is 50% of his fees, uh, of his profits, he will pay in corruption. He said, Corruption is why one kilo of air freight costs 8.5 U.S. dollars. It might be 6 U.S. dollars if we didn't have to worry about paying off customs officials. Even if you have all the legal things in place, someone will always try to arm twist you. They won't miss a way of making it difficult for you unless you pay them something. In Kenya, we don't have problems with rules and laws. Institutions don't matter to us. Nobody follows the rules. In Kenya, it's easy to get in with anything as long as you have money. And that's true of many other African countries as well. Now, um, from logistic agents' perspective, the real problem with bribery is not moral but procedural, as I said. It's how much money you have to pay on a regular basis. I must say that what this guy said, I'm a little skeptical because typically corruption involves the cargo agent paying less rather than more. I mean, more typically, for example, let's say you have 300,000 Kenyan shillings, you should pay a tax. 
the car delusion will say, okay, pay only 200000 and give me an extra 50000 for my pocket. So the government is, it's a lesser fee rather than a greater fee. So I, I don't quite know about these numbers he's talking about. Nonetheless, uh, that's what he's saying. Customs officials also steal goods. A Kenyan logistics agent said, there's a high rate of pilferage by customs officials in Kenya. You cannot send a Samsung Galaxy phone by air freight. It will not reach its destination. Not stealing, they'll do this directly in front of you. They will go over laptops and keep one. If you refuse, they'll like, make life difficult for you in other respects. As a Nigerian logistics agent told me, last week I lost a package at Lagos Airport. The customs agent opened my package and took away two iPads and some jewelry, which my customer sent from China. It's corruption. When we pack the iPads, we have to be very careful. Group the small items inside the larger package so customs cannot take them. Customs officials, these accounts indicate, are basically thieves. They're not protecting you against thievery. They themselves are thieves, robbers, and crooks, as I said earlier. Now, the most profound case of illicit activities I've heard of in my research involves not goods, but ballots. It involves the Kenyan presidential election in 2013. As one logistics agent said to me, I believe the election in Kenya was stolen. A contract for making the ballot papers was given to a company in Guangzhou, and ballots were taken back to Kenya by couriers through customs. The ballots were marked with a vote for Kenyatta, who wound up being the winning candidate, arriving on Sunday just before the election. In Guangzhou, you only need to give the company the sample. They don't understand what the ballot stands for, but they can make very good copies. There are printing companies in Kenya too, but they may not have the technology to make the ballots look close to genuine. I was asked to send the ballots, but I didn't want to use my company name. I didn't do it. The courier who visited me left me US $500 to pay for the lunch we ate together. I played ignorant. Now, I'm not saying personally that there was corruption here, that the Kenya election was stolen. I don't know. But I did have three different Kenyan logistics agents tell me stories like this. This was the most vivid and most specific of them. This guy was a supporter of Odega, who was in Kenya. But on the other hand, Kenyatta won by 50.1%. So it wouldn't take very many ballots to push him over the 50% level. Now, another Kenyan, who was a supporter of Kenyatta, said this, it was highly unlikely the election could have been stolen because there were about 16 different districts in Kenya, and you'd have to distribute the ballots to these different districts. It would have been hard to do this. But, who knows? Who can say? To me, and, and I'm not saying it was rigged, but that's certainly what many of the car agents I spoke with believe. The funny thing is, when I gave this example to my Nigerian informants, they said, that's not surprising. The last Nigerian election was stolen in Guangzhou, too. <laughs> I mean, clearly copies are more than just economics. These guys believe, and they could be right, that African politics is shaped out of Guangzhou through copy ballots. Okay, let me conclude here with a defense, a partial defense of copies. Customs regimes are fighting a losing battle. You know, they just can't stop copies and knockoffs getting through. It really is impossible. Technologically, maybe there's a need for copies a little bit less, but come on, all this stuff gets through. There's no way to stop it. Is this a bad thing? No. Consumers of copies are not typically misled into thinking they bought original goods. Sometimes they are, but typically no. You know, as these guys have told me, in Kenya, everybody knows what a copy is. No one's going to get fooled, even in the remotest of villages. What happens is, typically someone can't afford the original, and so buys the copy as a stepping stone. I'll buy a copy Samsung Android now, and five years from now, I hope I'm rich enough to get the original. Yes, the copies break easily, but everybody knows that, so what? They might be 40% or 60% of the price of the original, so... A former Nokia employee I spoke with said that, she told me off the record when we were drinking, Nokia knows this. They know that copies, that, that these copy goods aren't really a threat. They know that they're aspirational and, and they're not occupying the same niche as the original. And, and I think she's probably right. 
I earlier mentioned the Apple detective I talked to. The Apple detective said copies are like whack-a-mole. You know, that game you, you play in American parks. So something sticks up, you hit it with a hammer, then another sticks up, another sticks up, another sticks up. You can't stop them. Uh, the same is true with the solar light inventor I was telling you about. You can't stop these. All you can do is keep a lid on it. Copies are going to be made anyway. African traders in China, as might be expected, overwhelmingly endorse the trade in copies. They think they're a good thing. As a Kenyan trader told me, nobody in my country can buy an original brand of suit or an original phone by a famous company. It's too expensive. But these copies can show them good things. The traders are bringing the world to Africa. Now, I would argue that China's major role in bringing globalization, not just to the wealthy world, but to the world as a whole, is a rather extraordinary thing. And I would argue that when history books are written, when economic history books are written about China in the early 21st century, this will be China's major contribution, making copies and knockoffs that bring globalization to poor parts of the world like Africa, like parts of Latin America, like South Asia. That's its major role. Many Chinese wouldn't want to hear this, but this is what's going on. The logistics agents I talked with didn't see copies as the enemy. The enemy instead was their own country's government, their own customs regime. That was the enemy here. Their governments are based on pilferage and thievery. As the Nigerian logistics agents told me, the government in Nigeria is terrible. But if you're in Nigeria, being involved in the government is the only way you can make money, by siphoning it off, getting it off from all the citizens. If Nigeria had a decent government, I wouldn't be here in China. And I've heard this over and over again from different uh, Nigerian traders. So, in sum, copies and knockoffs are what enable poorer countries of the world to enjoy the fruits of globalization despite the corruption of their own governments. Now, corruption should be condemned, I maintain, but copies and knockoffs should not be castigated, but to a degree, anyway, celebrated. Yes, there are intellectual and commercial property rights that must be considered to some extent. You know, iPhone, Apple put in a lot of research work making iPhones. That does need to be respected to some degree. You know, of course that does. If everything were instantly copied, you wouldn't have much technological innovation. I understand that and agree with that. The detective working for Apple told me this very clearly, and I think he's right. Yes, copies of goods such as medicines, if not electronic goods and clothing, can sometimes have catastrophic health effects. Absolutely. You know, copying retroviral drugs against AIDS, copying insulin, you can kill a lot of people that way. These are terrible things. They shouldn't be tolerated. But globalization should belong not just to part of the world, but to all the world. And knockoffs and copies are what make this possible. So I guess my conclusion here is not three cheers for copies, but maybe two ambivalent cheers. They do play an important role.